Okay, hello. So, this is the Just Flight Fokker F28, released probably like a week ago, I think, for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. And this is going to be a full flight tutorial going over basic operating procedures. We're not going to be doing any emergency procedures. We're going to be doing basic operating procedures. We're going to be including tests and uh, a rough idea of how they do it in the real aircraft. Obviously, uh, there are a few things that I'm going to do that cater to me specifically. Everyone has their own way of flying the aircraft in the sim. Uh, this is just my way, and that's it. That's uh, But it should give you a very, very good idea of how to operate this aircraft. This is going to be a definitive tutorial that uh, anyone can use to learn how to fly this plane. So, we're at ramp 12 at Port Moresby Airport in Papua New Guinea. We are operating for Air Nui Guinea or something. And we're going to be doing a one and a half hour flight to uh, Madang Airport. It's actually more like an hour. Uh, I'm going to get up a uh, sky vector here and show you the route. So we're here at Port Moresby and we're going to fly to Madang, which is on the northern side of the island. Um, we're going to be using conventional navigation because this is an old aircraft, but I am going to teach you how to use the GNS 530 retrofit because I know a lot of people like to fly with retrofits. But the basic idea for the flight plan is we're going to fly an outbound radial from the Port Moresby VOR uh, via the Hotel 401 airway to NADZAB VOR and then fly the outbound radial on Hotel 401 to the Alpub intersection and then direct Port Mor or direct Medang Airport. Um, there is no standard arrival or standard departure procedure that suits our aircraft's capabilities. So it's uh, it's going to be mainly relying on like uh, visual procedures and, and stuff like that, which is good because it's it's a very clear day. So that's going to be very helpful. Uh, there's not much else to it. Um, we're flying a conventional navigation. That's really the only uh, main difference in our flight plan. Otherwise, it's business as usual. So we're going to go into the cockpit here. And if you're not familiar or you've never seen an F-28 cockpit before, there's a lot of uh, different things, uh, even compared to other classic aircraft. A lot of things on this plane are different. And uh, I'm going to explain all of them to you. The first thing I want to explain is the EFB, because as is with most simulator aircraft, the EFB uh, controls most of the plane's uh, external factors. So the first thing is the OFP, where if you link your SimBrief pilot ID, you can get a OFP and other information based on whatever recent flight you've dispatched. So as we can see, Port Moresby to Medang, airline, routes, other stuff, uh, METARs, the OFP itself. Um, that's my. I probably shouldn't have leaked my pilot ID there. That's fine. I'll probably just censor that. You get a map, and you can link your Navigraph account and uh, put in charts and stuff. But I still just prefer to use the external app because I find it's easier. And this is the meat of everything. This is the aircraft page. So you can input different weights. Uh, you can open and close doors, uh, you can chalk the wheels, put in the ground power, you can load different panel states, you can play different cabin announcements. If you click the cog up here, you can get many different settings about your aircraft. Uh, the only thing I've really done is I've removed the cockpit pilots because that's really annoying to have another physical pilot in the cockpit. And uh, I've included the uh, the GPS, obviously, here because I want to teach people how to use the retrofit in this plane. Uh, the TCAS VSI also counts as a retrofit, but there's nothing you can really do with that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you have linked your SimBrief account and you go to the aircraft page, you should get a pop-up notification asking if you want to input the weights from your OFP. This is very reliable. I've done it many times. Um, it pretty much inputs the weights almost exactly to how it's read in the OFP, so it, it kind of skips having to type in all the different weight values, so that's very helpful. Uh, notes page, you can just type in notes, but I, I use an, an external notepad app on my computer for, for flights and stuff. I don't really find using this to be very helpful. Um, you have all the checklists for the uh, aircraft. For the sake of the tutorial, I'm not going to be using checklists. Uh, I'm just going to teach you how to fly it 
uh, the way I fly it and using checklists can definitely be helpful when you're learning the aircraft though. Top of descent calculator, um, this can be useful in I guess some scenarios. Uh, usually I just take whatever sim brief says and push it back by like 10 nautical miles, 20, 20 nautical miles, and that works perfectly fine, honestly. And then you have basic settings for the FB theme, brightness, all that stuff. Pretty basic. You can, uh, you can tilt it and adjust it with these arrows on the side here, which I, I don't know, I guess that's useful. And you can hide it with, uh, by clicking this uh, air vent here. And we're going to hide it for now because we're not going to be using it. Um, so as I said, we have the chocks on, we have the ground power connected, so um, we're going to go to the overhead panel here, and the overhead panel is divided pretty well. It, it has different um, schematics and whatnot that you can go off of. I just realized I forgot to set my views for this aircraft. That's fine. That's fine, honestly. That happens. So uh, we're going to put the battery on, and we're also going to put the external power on. Make sure it says ready. Then it'll say on. You'll notice this plane has a lot of different status indicators. Um, and I'm going to go through the overhead flow now. So the first thing we want to check is make sure that our, both our engine generator lights are uh, on to show that they're inoperative because obviously the engines are not running. We're going to arm the emergency lights and make sure that light extinguishes. Battery isolate switch and constant speed drive disconnect switches should both be off and guarded. Um, and I'm going to explain to you what these are now. These are uh, mechanical like status symbols or, sw or indicators. Um, they turn depending on what systems are active. Uh, and this is most prominent in the bleed air panel. So uh, let's say you turn one of these on. And, oh no, that's the anti-ice panel, sorry. Let's say you, uh, you turn one of these on and there you are actually getting bleed air. Well this will turn to show that the system is actually active. I'll show that to you later on. We're going to check our voltage on both our batteries, which is good. We're going to check the external power voltage. They're all in the green bands. That's good. We're going to leave the APU off for now. We're just going to run on GPU. Bleed air supply up here. You're going to want to make sure these two switches are on auto and these two are on as well. We're going to want both of these off for now. Set your temperatures as accordingly. I'm just going to leave it as is for now because that works perfectly fine. Duct temperatures good. Cabin temperatures good. I'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary. We're going to set our cabin altitude. So today we're going up to flight level 300. So I believe, yeah, we're going to set it here. So as this little thing goes up, we're just going to set it to 31. Always set at 1,000 above your cruise. And uh, we're also going to set the local Q&H, which for this airport is, I'm just going to, I'm actually going to type it in here. We're going to set this to 1011. And that all looks good to me. I don't believe you can set field elevation on this system. Uh, I've had no problems with it, so that's fine. Also turn the no smoking uh, lights or signs on. Uh, obviously, we can perform some tests on the overhead. Test the CVR. That's all good. Windshield heating. Uh, the current ambient air temperature is 21 degrees, so I'm going to leave it off for now. We'll turn it on low after starting the engines. If it's below 20 degrees, you can turn it on low for now, but otherwise that's fine. This can stay on RH. These can all stay off. This is the anti-ice page, by the way, or panel, by the way. That's the engines. That's the wings. It's sometimes very hard to tell what each system does. You have to really look for the line so you can see the engine. And then if you look here, wing, tail, it's a little bit unconventional but it's something you can get used to so I'm just going to perform a quick scan before I continue to the next panel make sure I'm not missing any uh, tests I'll leave this on battery and external power just so it's displaying something 
press this test button for the ice detection you're going to want to look for that light and also there's going to be an ice detection light here that's going to illuminate for exactly one minute there isn't really a reset switch for it it just goes on for one minute okay that all looks good so i'm going to go to the pedestal now which is this one we want to make sure that all of our hydraulic flight control systems their respective lights are on also going to want to make sure the gust lock is on and the lift umper lock is guarded and the alternate landing gear lever is up because obviously we're not providing any hydraulic pressure right now I'm going to turn on both of our master radio switches this is going to turn on all our radio equipment we can test the marker audio that's for high that's for low frequency or whatever we got to make sure the roll and pitch channels are in and the autopilot and yaw damper are off and these are all set to normal we can turn our HFCOM panel to AM, that's all. We can turn our transponder to standby. Altitude reporting on, make sure it's squawking the IFR code. Um, we're gonna skip that test for now. So there's no ATC, obviously. We're on VATSIM, but there is no ATC. So we can turn this to Unicom 1 to 2.8, but I wanna show you something here. Uh, here's VPILOT see if I can get this here you can see it says 1 to 2.8 but if I scroll this once it says 1 to 2.805 uh, that's because this is like an older radio system and they don't have a sixth digit but vpilot does so always double check with vpilot to make sure you actually have the correct frequency I think you can still hear frequencies properly despite being five digits off but it's for the sake of uh, for a uh, realism or whatever might as well keep it as is and we're going to tune the standby or not the standby we don't have a standby we have com one and com two uh, so if you want to switch between frequencies like if you're switching from tower or approach to tower i recommend you have uh the standby frequency on com two and then i'm going to teach you how to use the vhf panel to uh, switch from com one to com two quickly and efficiently we'll turn our volume knobs on as well we can leave the squelch off uh, these are our these are our, uh, ndb adf whatever radios you'll turn it to adf turn on this bfo switch that's all you really need to do with that and uh, we'll configure the radio panel so we're monitoring vhf1 so let's say you want to switch to com2 to switch to a different frequency just press vhf2 this will automatically depress and as you can see on vpilot, we're, we're switched to that uh, frequency and then just press it back again. So we're monitoring and talking on VHF-1. We'll monitor um, the interphone. And we'll monitor the marker audio and the loudspeaker audio. Same thing goes for this side, except we'll, we'll get the first officer to monitor VHF-2. Actually, we're going to leave it on VHF-1 because messes up the pilot for us and this is where all your light controls are we're going to leave the nav light on that's all and uh yeah i'm going to show you the throttle quadrant here which is a little bit to unconventional we're going to want to make sure we have our ttc switch on takeoff that's uh it's 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 like a that's its own version of like a, a takeoff d rate system it doesn't have an auto throttle we're going to want to make sure that all our boost pumps are off, but we're going to want to test to make sure they hold pressure by turning on one switch and these two respective lights should go out. Turning on one switch, they both go out. Turning on one switch, they both go out. That's how you test that. We don't have any fuel in the center tank, so that's not going to do anything. Crossfeed switch is off, which is good. And our fuel cutoff lever, lever, le 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 levers are both shut off. Uh, bulk of the tests you can do are up in this panel here. And again, I want to make sure all our hydraulic fluids are in the green. We have good pressure. We obviously, don't have pressure uh, for the flight control systems because the engines are not running. Check that we have the correct fuel quantity and we're not having any in the center tank here that's all fine and dandy so we can test now the APU fire extinguisher and that's good and we're gonna test the engine fire warnings on both sides
Now you could look up to see if it's uh, showing the light on the glare shield. I might see if I can actually do that here real quick. Yeah, it's a bit awkward. It's hard to do with the camera system in this game. That's all good and fine. We can do a skid control test as well. You'll notice I'm skipping some tests. This is just as per the um, the manual that I've learned that some tests you just don't do. I don't know why, I'm not really complaining. So that's good on that side, and that's good on that side. Gotta make sure all these switches are down and guarded. Parking brake is set. Do the lamp test here, which is specifically for three lights, so that's good. And uh, we can also make sure these switches are down and guarded. We can test enunciator panel, both bright and dim. We're gonna make sure that all these brake pressures, or temperatures, sorry, not pressures, are in the green. There's a flight recorder, yes, right here. Uh, you are going to input your flight number, which for us is 110, and the date, it's the uh, the 19th today, so that's inputted, and uh, which is good. As well as this side, same thing, you know the deal. So we don't have a weather radar, this is normally where the re weather radar will go, but it's been replaced by the Garmin 530, so we don't have to worry about this panel. But if you did have the weather radar, at the moment you'd switch it to standby and you'd tilt it to like 5 degrees up, or 2.5 is what I usually do. Before we get to the Garmin, we're going to double check that all these engine vitals are looking normal, and they do look normal. Uh, this is a very important panel here, these uh, engine uh, N1%, whatever you want to call it, because we're going to be using these for the takeoff momentarily to calculate uh, thrust performance for takeoff. And that's all good there. We can also set local pressure, which is 1011. I have the uh, altimeter synced, so don't need to worry about that. Never mind, apparently they aren't synced. Okay. Fix that uh, warning there. We'll test. So this is um. There's, let's say you're coming in on approach and you have a speed bugged with this bug. This will levitate kind of around that, and it'll uh, it'll definitely prove useful. Most people don't actually use that feature. Coming up to the glare shield, we have our two uh, nav radio tuners turn both of these to DME. We'll make sure this is selected on that one. This is going to be very useful, obviously, because we're flying conventional. Make sure the lift dumpers are in. That's very important. And let's see. All of that uh, looks good. This is the flight director. It's, it's very primitive, but trust me, I, I will use it for the sake of uh, for this tutorial. Okay. So that kind of completes the uh, panel scan really it's it's not too much it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty uh, pretty normal pretty chill okay now we're gonna finally get to programming uh, our flight so I'm gonna get the boring stuff out of the way with the uh, GNS 530 this really is a tutorial in and of itself but the main way that you hook it up to the HSI as you have the CDI button down here. If it says GPS, it is linked to the HSI, as you can tell. And if I click this and it says VLOC, then it's the HSI is working with the nav radios. That's really it. That's all there is to it. Um, you have a, a couple lights here, GPS, that will illuminate for the autopilot if you're uh, following the GPS track. And it's it's basically the same if you were flying a VOR. You, you use the beam function here. This is a, 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 an autopilot mode in which it will either follow the VOR or the GPS track. And that's it. I'll show that in, uh, in, the, in the practice uh, when we're in cruise just to, just to uh, further drive home my point. Anyways, we're gonna, we're gonna start setting up the flight here. So the first thing we're gonna do is turn Port Moresby VOR 117.0. And we're also going to tune NADZAB 
Now we're going to make sure this is on nav 1. Uh, depending on which one you click is what's going to show on the HSI. So if I click nav 1, uh, port uh, Moresby is going to be displayed on the HSI. If I click nav 2, it's going to be NADZAB. And it's important to note that your DME for the VOR you have displayed on the HSI is going to show up here. But it's also going to show the DME for whatever VOR you have uh, tuned on this side. So according to Skyvector, we're going to fly an outbound 344 radio. So, radio, so we'll tune 344 uh, in the course here. This is kind of going off of the knowledge that you already know how uh, conventional navigation works. Uh, if you don't, there's lots of tutorials online for you. <coughs> this is more based on the aircraft. So the winds are uh, variable at three knots. So we're just going to use runway one four left, which has a heading of one four two. So we're going to put that in. Now it doesn't have a like a heading a number indicator here. So what we're going to do really is just eyeball it, and that looks good. That looks like one four two to me. And of course, we're going to climb to the MSA and then just turn on course. That's basically how it works when you don't have an SID or sometimes you get radar vectors. So we're just going to climb to about 7,000 feet and uh, run, or no, we're going to climb to about 5,000 feet on runway heading and then turn on course because there's, there's mountains on the other side and sea on the other, but we're going to climb out towards the sea. Okay, so... Now that we've set that up and we've done our departure brief, we're going to just set to cruising altitude since uh, we'll clear ourselves up to that since there's no ATC. That's all good. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is set up a takeoff performance. So the first thing I want to do is the thrust performance. So we're working with 9,000 feet of runway, which means we can do a derated takeoff if we like, and I think I am going to do that. So as per the man or this comes in the manual uh it's this uh thrust index table that's that's what it is it's thrust index table um and i've, I've just taken a little snippet and i put it into its own image so i can show it to you guys uh what it is essentially is you combine uh your altitude above sea level level and the outside air temperature to get a, a good reading of what you want to do uh, what thrust you, you can take so it's it's 21 degrees so we're gonna go down to we'll call it 22 we're gonna go into this bar and the airport if I uh, take a look at the chart here is 129 feet above sea level so we'll just do 200 uh, there 20 uh, 22 degrees uh, 200 so that give us that gives us a uh, I guess whatever you want to call it an invalid uh, reading, which means we can we can do full throttle if we'd like for the takeoff. Um, we can go all the way, but obviously I, I don't really want to do that. Um, so instead, I'm uh, what I'm going to do is do a derated takeoff of uh, we'll say like 163. Uh, something 163 units of something I, I really don't know uh, it's worth noting that this table specifically is for an anti-icing off air conditioning on takeoff I'd say if you have anti-icing on you'd want to like push the engines a little bit more anyway so we're gonna tune this to 167 and because we have the TTC set to take off we're going to push the throttles basically all the way and it will automatically uh, go to 167 on this uh, it's kind of like in the uh, BAE 146 or Avro RJ jet if you're familiar with that it's it's a very similar system <clears throat> so this aircraft also has a smart takeoff card so it reads the current weight of your aircraft and then provides you with the takeoff card or and landing performance card here 
So because it's a 9,000 foot runway, we're going to do a flap six takeoffs, which gives us a V1, V rotate speed of 125 and a VT speed of 132. We can retract the flaps at 139 knots and a single engine climb minimum speed is 149 knots. We're obviously going to climb at V2 plus 10, which is 142, uh, up until about 1,500 feet, and we'll reduce to climb power. And we're going to climb initially, I'd say at like 180 knots. Um, when we start making that turn on course, we'll push it up to 200, I'd, I'd say. Uh, it's already been bugged for us. That's that's the most important thing to note, is that it's already been bugged for us, I think. Yeah. I think you got you to gotta click the specific number, and then it'll bug it there for you. It's kind of like the Mad Dog, except a little bit different. Okay, so we've done our takeoff performance. We've done our takeoff briefing for navigation and... and stuff like that we can set up the flight director we're going to initially pitch to like i don't know 10 degrees or so and uh we'll have this on heading for now it's very primitive but i, I guess it does provide some some amount of reference and it makes it worthwhile okay so i'm also going to actually program it into this i'll do it very very quickly because it's it's really you really got it know more about the uh you gotta really know about the uh, gns 530 uh, to use it with this plane which is like a tutorial in and of itself i mean you can pick up on it pretty fast so i guess we'll leave it at that now i don't know that that looks perfectly fine to me really and it's on VLOX, so our HSI is still slave to the regular navigation equipment, which is perfect. That's what we're going to use. All right, now we're going to get ready for the departure. So there's actually a couple more things I need to do in the cabin here. Uh, number one is I need to configure the lights and air conditioning. So that's fine. That's fine. Temperature. Auto. That's for the music, I guess. I think you can import custom music. Um, close the door, by the way. Music plays sometimes, I guess. And I, I believe that's all you can really configure. It's only one panel. Uh, there's something up here as well. But I've never seen this. is for PA. They didn't even show that in the thing. Anyways, uh, you can close the door through the EFB, or you can just close it manually with this thing here. It's uh, hydraulically powered by some force of nature. Very good, very good. Okay, we're going to start the APU. This has its own fuel pump. You don't need to turn on any fuel pump. What we're going to do is we're going to turn on the main switch. We're going to make sure that this says generator inoperative. We're going to make sure that the generator itself is off, which is good. And we're also going to turn the APU air switch on right now. We're going to hold this until it says 10 RPM. Then we can let go. At about 45%, it's going to cut out, I think. Yes. And at 95, the generator is going to become operable. Going to monitor the TGTs and the RPM, make sure we're not breaking it. It's worth noting that when you press the main switch, the inlet door takes like five seconds to open. So you got to wait five seconds before you turn it on. And the light's gone out. That's very good. We can turn one of the main bleed switches on which as you can see this status indicator will turn showing that we're actually providing bleed air to the cab and then we're getting air conditioning and all that stuff that's very good so we can turn off the gpu and you're going to get a flash for a second not to worry it's just switching over power uh, we're going to make sure that generator three which is the apu generator is providing good voltage i'm going to turn this back to generator one now very very good okay 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 all right so that's the apu running we're providing air conditioning now we're going to turn on the fasten seatbelt sign. We're still going to leave these PDO and vane heating switches off. This is for after engine start. Um, right about now, I think I'll turn on these windshield heat switches. Just because. I, I don't know. I'm usually used to having to turn them on immediately. It's just really hot out. So, Okay. So, next thing we can do is turn on the anti-coal, anti-collision, which has two switches for both top and bottom. Oh, we can turn on the transponder. 
da, 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 da. I'm just scanning. Okay. We are pretty much good for engine start. Thrust levers are idle. That's all good. So for engine start, we're obviously going to turn on our boost pumps. Which is all uh, fine and uh, dandy. We're also going to check our status panel here to make sure that nothing out of the ordinary is showing. This is all normal for before engine starts, so that's fine. We can go with that. And we're going to call the pushback. We're going to pre-plan it, I think. God, it's actually been a while since I've done this, so I don't really know how it works. Oh, wait, hang on. i got to disconnect everything. Oh, crap. Disconnect ground power. Disconnect shocks. That's it. That's all you have to do. And close any doors or whatever it's worth noting as well that um, the jetway won't connect to your aircraft if you don't press like a certain lever or button on the stairs that opens up a uh, like a floor plan a floor pan that covers this area for jetway usage uh, just flight show that in one of their videos Parking brakes are set. Excellent news. I'm going to teach you how to start these engines. So, turn this guy off. Turn the starter master on. I'm going to hold for number two. Wait a few seconds. Starter valves confirmed open. And we're going to check here. We can see that. RPMs are rising at 10% uh, RPM. We're going to move this up to the start position. And I believe at 20% RPM, we're going to move it to all the way forward, which is open. I knew that was what it was called. And we're going to monitor. I believe that said. There we go. Okay, so the TGTs are good. The RPMs are good. Oil pressure is good. And I'm also noticing that we have hydraulic pressure and these lights have extinguished. As well as we have a generator voltage on generator number two. Excellent, excellent news. Now we're going to do the exact same for number two. Hold it down for a few seconds. Note the starter valve is open. Monitor the RPMs. 10, start. Twenty, open. RPM is rising. TGT is rising. Oil pressure, fuel, oil pressure, and uh, fuel pressure are both rising. More specifically, oil pressure. That's important, obviously. TGT is rising. It all looks good. It all looks normal. There's the TGTs. There's the oil. Now we're running. Okay. Okay. So, you want to make sure all these fuel lights are extinguished, all these hydraulic lights are extinguished. Status panel is clear, that's good. Cancel this warning here. Alright, next thing we want to do is disconnect the APU generator, disconnect the APU air. We can turn both of these switches on now. Uh, before we turn off the APU main switch, we can also um, perform this test here, overspeed test. And that will shut down the APU. And then we can turn the APU main switch off. It's kind of a weird way that you stop it using an overspeed test, but that's just what the manual said, so I, I roll with it. Uh, generator 1 is providing good voltage. Perfect, excellent. We can turn the pitot and vane heating switches on now. 
once again we're going to leave the anti-ice as is because we don't need it double check that we have good duct pressure good cabin pressure and you want to have between like 40 to 50 psi uh, for the uh, bleed air pressure another thing that's uh, worth mentioning is for the hydraulics you have a uh, an electronic brake pump that you can use if you don't have enough brake pressure I just gotta find it first yeah here it is so let's say you don't have enough uh, hydraulic pressure in your brakes you can use this electric pump and it should increase it might be this one I don't know maybe it's not doing anything because it's already where it needs to be which obviously it is but I'm just I'm just saying just in case it happens uh, we can turn our gust lock off usually you only have this off for uh, takeoff but I need full control of the rudders to use the nose wheel steering that's a setting you can have turned on make sure your nose wheel steering is turned on obviously because I use the rudders to use the nose wheel I think most people do so ideally you'd want that off now which you do by pulling down obviously uh, we're gonna set flaps six degrees which is indicated here and uh, we can uh, we're only we're only gonna arm this whilst we're holding short I believe yeah no we can arm it now I'm pretty sure this is the uh, speed brake or lift dump no lift dumper that's what they call it in this plane the lift dumper you press the arm button and then you'll have a status page up here if it says ready you're good to go that means it's armed so that's all good we can also turn the yaw damper on and I believe that's all it's worth noting as well that uh, on the EFB if you click the uh, hang on let me let me change the trim here for the sake of this if you click the CG SMC button it will automatically set your trim for takeoff because uh, there isn't really a table for that that comes with this plane that I know of. Anyways, parking brake is released. Uh, this plane does not need a lot of throttle to get going. You can usually just turn it up a little bit and then let it go and it'll coast. So we're gonna get off at Charlie here, go on Bravo and on to Alpha and hold short one for left. Uh, there, it's it, you know, taxi like taxis like basically any other plane of this size. You know, just be delicate, and uh, yeah, you'll be fine. All right, we're approaching the hold short line, which obviously we're just gonna we're just gonna barrel right through that because there's no traffic. But obviously now I'm going to uh, start preparing the aircraft for takeoff so we can turn the weather radar on even though we don't have one. We can call the stewardess to say that we're about to take off. And for this, we are going to have the landing lights and the flare out lights extended and on. That's all the lights, uh, as well as the strobe light. And the TTC is set for takeoff, lift dumpers are armed, all that is just, okay, that's, yeah. I forgot to mention, uh, if you use MSFS regularly, you'll know that the controls will lock if you uh, use the, uh, move the camera around or whatever. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's really annoying and I'm surprised they haven't patched it yet. Anyways. Okay, all is well. As I said, we're going to fly runway heading up to 5,000 feet, and uh, then we're going to turn on course. Rolling takeoff, obviously. we got a lot of runway to work with. So, we are good to go. We're going to obviously push the nose down, standard airline aircraft procedure slowly advance the throttles to maximum detent and 
the TTC should take care of the uh, thrust for us. Checked, releasing forward pressure. Slowly lift back, rudder is neutral. Positive rate of climb, gear up. And we're gonna pitch to maintain about 150 knots. Trying to keep the wings level, trying to stay on runway heading. Which is a bit difficult in MSFS because I find the controls are really sensitive. Alright, he's calling for flaps up. I'm going to take flaps up. 800 feet. Setting climb power. And we're going to pitch the nose down to a pitch for that. Now, we can turn the autopilot on. We'll say IAS heading right about 200 knots flaps are up we'll bug that speed now okay we're gonna turn off the uh, taxi light and the flare out lights and the TT or the lift dumpers are disarmed we can turn the TTC to climb now. And we're passing just about 5,000 feet. So I'm going to turn the heading to intercept the radial from uh, Papua New Guinea VOR, which is going to be a little bit, I'm gonna, I wanna make a turn this way. So I'm just gonna leave it like that for now. It's a big turn we gotta make here. It's worth noting that transition level here is 210, so we got a ways to go. And that's it. Now we are we are climbing essentially. You really just want to monitor the vitals of everything, switch whatever frequencies you need to switch, you know, fly the aircraft. Simple as that, really. And there's downtown Port Moresby. There's the airport. Passing through 7,000 feet. So we're doing about 200 knots and about 85% RPM. Fuel flow gauges are active. We can see on the GNS here that we're following the route we have preset. So uh, let's see here. We're going to. We'll go on like a 20 degree deficit, just about because, yeah, I believe we're tracking inbound Port Moresby. All right, so the IAS in this plane goes off of your current indicated airspeed, not what you bug. So I'm, I want to go up to 220. So what we're going to actually have to do is we're going to bug 220. And then we're going to go to uh, pitch and I don't believe this actually no this doesn't actually control the pitch on the autopilot you have to go down here and use this little blue thing so we'll get it to pitch down for us here hopefully it's it's kind of spacey it's not the uh, the greatest autopilot so bear with me here there we go it's pitching down to about a thousand feet per minute which should give us enough uh, wiggle room to accelerate I'd actually like to go up to 250 now that we're reaching 10,000 feet there we go okay so we'll bug 250 there 10,000 feet we can turn off the fasten seatbelt sign I believe there's no smoking on because this flight was being operated in the early 2000s which is like I don't know like they pretty sure they phased that out by then uh, we can turn off our landing lights. It's worth noting we should check to make sure. Um, for the climb, you don't really want more than 500 feet per minute cabin altitude climb. And for the descent, I don't think I think you don't want more than a thousand. So make sure make sure to monitor that. Yeah, the window heat and the pitot vane heating, cabin temperatures good, ducts temperatures good. Uh, excellent bleed air pressure there. 
hydraulic fluid quantities are all good as well as our hydraulic pressures are all in the green it's all very good it's all according to plan we'll push her up to about 90 percent rpm because we're really struggling to hit 250 there um as we approach the vor track actually you can click beam and it'll arm So we're flying, I, I didn't even mention, we're flying the Dash 4000 variant. There's four variants, the Dash 1000, 2000, 3000, 4000. And the only difference is really is the length of the fuselage and the design of the wings. So the 4000 is the longest of the F-28 uh, family, and I believe it does have the updated wing design. So a little bit more state-of-the-art. Let's see if I can get a, a nice picture. Yeah, that works. Okay, so coming back into the cockpit, we can see VOR Loke is green. Heading has de-illuminated, that means the aircraft's autopilot has found the VOR track and it's going to be tracking it outbound. Once again, really struggling to hit 200 knots there. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select height hold, which is going to level off the aircraft, and then we'll be able to get back up to uh, the speed that we want to get up to. We'll push the engines a little bit more. There we go, now we're getting up to speed. So now that we're tracking the VOR and the GPS says we're flying the leg from uh, Port Moresby to Nadj Nadzab, sorry I don't remember the names of this that well, I can go IAS now actually, nice and easy. Um, I can show you how you can track GPS routes with this plane and it's really easy. Literally click the CDI button, slaves to GPS. And because we're already on B mode, the CDI and the autopilot are both tracking from the GPS. And turn CDI off again, we're back to VR loc. CDI, GPS, CDI, VR loc. That's it. It's that simple. You can use this to fly SIDs, STARS, approach procedures, RNAV, whatever you want, really. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I don't really like using this because it, it kind of defeats the purpose of flying a classic aircraft. You kind of fly it so you can live in its golden age when the, it, it was using the equipment that it came with. Uh, sometimes it's fun to fly classic aircraft with retrofits, but it's not really what I do it for. I still prefer to use conventional navigation. It's more fun. It's more interesting. It keeps you on your toes. You're constantly having to do updates and stuff like that. <coughs> So we're tracking 22 miles outbound from Port Moresby. The DME for NADZAB has not shown up yet. The leg from Port Moresby to NADZAB, if I check Sky Vector, is uh, 94 nautical miles. So I guess NADZAB's not that uh, big of a. Sorry, it's not. It's not even 94. It's like it's like 200-ish. I was reading that wrong. So that makes sense. So there's not really much else to say. Um, when it reaches the altitude that you've set on here, it will automatically level off. The autopilot will automatically level off for you. And because it's got no throttle, auto throttle, you just have to manage the throttles yourselves. You can leave the TTC uh, on climb mode for now. Um, for uh, for climbing crews, you can leave it on climb. That's fine. And yeah, just just monitor the aircraft. You know, if it's busy airspace, monitor the ATC. You need to go on a vector. You know how to use the heading mode. You know you know how to climb and descend with the autopilot. Um, yeah. There's not much else to it, really. So I'm going to check in with you guys. 
when we're about like 50 miles from top of descent and I'm going to brief you for the approach and I'm going to tell you all the things you got to do to set the aircraft up for landing which really there is not a lot to do there's not a lot you really have to do to be honest um, most of it most of the bulk of this aircraft's complexity comes in the pre-flight procedures otherwise once you're up in the air it's uh, it's pretty smooth sailing hello I'm speaking to you now we are 30,000 feet in the air a little bit slow from our cruise speed and uh, we're about to cross over NADZAB as you can tell we just lost uh, communication with it so we're gonna fly heading mode and we're gonna switch over this is uh, just basic stuff from con conventional VOR flying we're flying off of NAV2 so we're gonna tune the course 320 and now we're going to turn to intercept it. Very, very slight heading deficit because of our proximity to it. When you're flying at about 30,000 to 40,000 feet, um, at about five miles from the VOR is when you're flying overheaded. So that's when you want to switch over. But I'm, I'm showing you this now because now is around the time where we want to start our descent. In fact, it's about 20 miles outbound from the ADZAB where we're going to start our descent. <coughs> so let's uh, do a little approach brief uh, port or sorry Madang Airport does not really have any uh, SID or S star procedures uh, and even if they did they probably wouldn't be suitable for us so it's going to be a uh, direct to the approach fix initial approach fix so let's take a look at what they have So both approaches for both ends of the runways are RNAV uh, approaches. They're both RNAV approaches, which means they're not applicable to us, and we're going to have to take a VOR approach because Madang, the or sorry, not a, we're going to have to take a visual approach, not a VOR approach, because Madang does not have its own VOR or NDB or TACAN or <clears throat> anything like that. So that being said going a little too fast here. I want to get the Metar for Madang to see if a visual approach is even possible. Looking at the Metar online, I just googled it. It says wind 162 at 2, 80% cloud cover, broken clouds. Temperature is 24 degrees. Pressure is 1010. Humidity is 91%. We can uh, we can edit 1010 here. Which is already said because I believe the departure field was 1010. And we're at about 21 miles outbound, so we can start our descent. Um, according to Sky Vector, the, uh, the MDA uh, in and around Badang is about 5,000 feet, but uh, we have mountains. So I'm going to stop our descent at about 16,000 feet. So we're going to send to 16,000 initially, and when we're clear of those mountains, uh, we'll be good to go. So, real simple, IAS, throttle down, ever so slightly, don't want to overdo it, and you want to make sure you don't exceed more than about a thousand feet per minute in the cabin depressurization rate uh, thing. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And for the descent, you can actually switch the TTC back to takeoff. And uh, if you need to uh, reduce the thrust levers to below when the gear horn was silenced, you press this button and it'll silence it for you. You see there? Yeah. <clears throat> so, very, very well. So, yeah, descending 16,000 initially, I'm going to plan the approach into Madang pretty meticulously because we don't, we don't really have an approach we can do. We, technically, we can do it with the GPS, but we're going to pretend that we don't have it. I just have this here for the sake of... Uh, more universal tutorial experience. So, if the uh, the the field elevation is actually zero, I don't know. It's eighteen feet, and the MSA at the sea is five thousand. So, once we're clear of those mountains, we'll descend down to five thousand. I can actually see. I believe that's the ocean there. So, I think we're all good. So the intersection that we're going to 
Alpub is 98 miles from the dang. So I'm thinking that we fly overhead Alpub at 5,000 feet. And if we have visual with the airport, we're going to shoot a visual approach into the runway uh, 25, which is over the sea. And we're going to do a flaps 42 landing uh, because I want to try and get off a little bit earlier so I don't have to backtrack or nothing. Uh, so if I click 115 here, it should it should bug the ref speeds. Yeah, I believe I have to bug 115 myself with this specific one. Yeah, it, see, it bugged it for me. So I'm just going to put it back to like here because that's what I'm descending at. Um, because of the winds, I'm going to add like five knots to my VRF, which makes a VRF of a, of a 120. That's what we're going to come in at. Um, and obviously I'm going to guide you through all that and tell you how it works as we do it. I'm not really going to brief you. I'm just going to show you as we do it because I find that's easier. The approach procedure in this uh, plane is pretty uh, pretty normal. So yeah, that's the plan. Um, I can tell visually that we're clearing these mountains. So I think it's safe to say that we can uh, continue our descent down to uh, 5,000 feet. Normally, radar vectors would be really useful, but since we don't, we're going to have to do this by ourselves, so that's just my plan. If we fly over Alpub and we can't see the airport, I guess we have to divert. Um, I'm not going to divert. I'll just shoot an RNAV approach with the GPS, because I I, for the sake of linearity of this tutorial, it's, it's, uh, it's easier that way. So, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to check back with you when we are overhead Alpub because or actually no when we pass through 10,000 feet because that's when you actually need to do something with the aircraft otherwise you're just you're just flying it really okay you join me passing 10,000 feet or about seven miles from Alpub uh, we're a bit higher than we expect to be but that's okay uh, we're still doing 250 knots so we don't really have to adjust our speed but uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to turn the seatbelt sign on and we're also going to turn our landing and flare lights on. The TDC is set to take off. One thing I forgot to do is adjust the tilt on the weather radar, but that's just basic knowledge. You know, you adjust that to zero for cruise and then whatever for landing. It's it's really based on preference. We can also actually have this on VOR look, the flight director. I never I never changed that. Um it's worth noting that there's an auto mode for the engine anti-ice, so it'll automatically come on if the aircraft detects icing. I had it off, and uh, the aircraft detected icing, which lights up uh, here. And you can just turn these to auto and then the airfoil on. But it, it's worth leaving these on auto. I probably should have done that earlier. It's whatever. So uh, we're entering clouds, but the outside air temperature is what? Like 15 degrees or 10 degrees, so I'll, I'll still leave it off for now. And we're just about to fly over Alpo about 8,000 feet. And we're breaking through the clouds now, a couple thousand above MSA. So I'm going to start looking for the airport, which uh, should be on our right side. Yeah, there's the runway right there. Okay. So we have visual contact with the airport. So we can kick her back into heading mode. And what I'm going to do is get it to fly on a, uh, on a left base here for uh, runway... Uh, Two five, which is uh, what I don't know. It's heading two five zero. So it's heading seventy, seventy degrees. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And we're gonna leave her at five thousand, I guess. Actually, no. We're, we're gonna kick her back down to uh. 2000 here and we're also going to put her back into pitch because I want to 
lower us down to 200 knots. Good time to show off the uh, speed brake here. No, we'll, we'll do this one actually. So yeah, this it's worth noting that this no, that's this is the one you use in flight. It's worth noting this aircraft does not have any reverse thrust. Um, you literally just have speed brakes, but you have very good ones and in great quantities. So it, it really works out in the end. So gonna make sure we keep the runway on our side there. And uh, when we hit 3,000 feet, we're going to turn base. I'd say right about there is good to go back into IAS. This aircraft is uh, really good at managing speed. So as per, per previously said, we're going to land with flaps 42, which gives us a VRF of 115. With the winds factored, it's 120. So we're going to extend the flaps incrementally. Um, Starting at uh, about 150, I uh, will say we'll say 160 knots, or 180 really. Around that is good enough to start extending flaps. So we're coming down to 3,000 and uh, checking out the uh, right side of the window. That looks pretty good. We'll we'll, we'll keep going for a little bit more. But uh, I'm leveling off here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is. Uh, we're gonna start our turn now. We're gonna go into, we'll set our MSA to be what? Like, I don't know, 200 feet. So pitch, we're gonna go to pitch mode now and we're gonna turn base. We'll leave it at there for now. That's a bit much for me, so I'm gonna. Get him to pull up a little bit. Come on. This autopilot pitch system is really bad. I'm just going to take manual control. Leave the yaw damper on for now. And we'll fly just, just by pitch, really, honestly. We'll fly just by pitch. And I've, I've bugged 250 there, so that's good. Checked. Gonna level off now. Gonna extend flaps six degrees. In preparation for landing, we're going to turn on the taxi light and we're gonna arm the lift dumpers with that button there. Can't miss it. Alright, there's the runway there. We're definitely a tad bit low, but nevertheless, yeah, we'll, we'll extend the gear. So what are we, like 10 miles out? Yeah, we'll hold her steady. Definitely not my finest visual approach, but we're still doing pretty much what we need to do. So I should I should elaborate when the lift dumpers are armed. As soon as the uh, the weight of the wheels touch the ground, they they should deploy. Just ignore that there. Okay. We'll go flaps forty two. And we'll bug the speed as well. Just about 120. So as you can see, that little thing on the uh, attitude indicator is going to come in really helpful. You can really just have your eyes on that to uh, help you maintain speed during the approach. I think my spoiler is still out. Probably help if I had that in. But yeah, according to the flap indicator, we have flaps 42 down. Tad bit slow. Keeping a 
bit, bit of a shallow descent right now we're doing good nice and easy okay perfect perfect tad high I think we're three white one last outside scan we're looking good okay it's all us now four white now so we'll send her down a little bit don't really want to exceed more than a thousand feet per minute on the approach unless it's a uh, non non-standard glide path all right three white we're gonna start to shallow it out there checked I put minimums 200 feet just cuz continue in reality, our minimums were like 5,000 feet because it's entirely visual. Okay, we're coming over the threshold. 20. Gently, 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 gently. All right, we're down. Just about. We're going to apply brakes and fly the nose wheel down. Forward pressure, forward pressure. There go the lift dumpers. And not the other one on the wing there. I don't know where that is, but whatever. Alright, lift dumper status says out. We can uh, put these guys back in. We can turn the weather radar to standby. And we can just get off on this slightly precarious taxiway put the flaps in there we go brakes were still somewhat on we can uh, turn all these lights off okay excellent 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 there we go we're at Medang bit of a sketchy landing but yeah I don't know man I, I haven't simmed in like two months I only really got back into the sim just to fly this plane because I was kind of excited for it I was really I was really annoyed when they canceled it for p3d because in my opinion I, I still enjoy flying p3d I really like the camera system I hate the camera system in the Microsoft flight sim so now we can turn off our pedo and vane heating switches we can also open up the APU inlet door, give that a second. And now we'll turn it on and such. Excellent, excellent. And uh, if you're if you do have a, your own nose wheel axis, now would be the time to turn the gust lock on. But since I don't, we're gonna keep it on. Flight director can come off. Okay, and we're just going to pick like any stand, honestly. First one seems viable, which means taxi light can come off. And now we can, we'll see how well we can do of a parking job here. No marshaller, obviously. I can't see the line. I don't know, would you call that good? There we go, there we go. I'd say you're right about there. We'll just straighten out the nose wheel. Excellence, sort of. So, parking brake is set. The APU is on. We'll check to make sure the 
generators providing sufficient power. Now she's on. Okay, okay, excellent. So we can uh, cut off the fuel thingies, fuel cutoff levers, transponder back to standby. Fasten seatbelt light off. We can turn one of the bleed air switches off. These can stay as is. These can go off, window heats. Engine anti-ice can go back to off. That all looks fine and dandy to me. Just checking around, scoping around. That's normal. Okay, there, uh, there really is not much else to it. We are good to uh, deboard. So, I'm going to go here, aircraft. And we're going to open up the Ford passenger door and we'll chalk the wheels. Leave everything else closed for now. Now, uh, the deboarding music is playing. It's something you can manually activate. I believe that I was missing a panel that controls the lights. I could have sworn that they that they showed us a panel in the demo that controls the lights. Yes, right here, cabin lights. Okay, so yeah, here they are, cabin lights, which I, I never turned on. Uh, if you're flying at night, I suppose that's useful. Really, in the daytime, it, it doesn't really matter. But uh, other than that, that's pretty much it. Um, as I was saying as well about the jetway thing, if you click uh, this, I believe. That's how you turn it into like a jetway compatible stairway. So if you're if you're if you've extended this but your jetway isn't connecting, that's probably why you need to push this down. But uh, yeah, that's it. That's literally it, man. That's the Fokker F28 from Just Flight. That's how you fly it, start to finish. No special procedures. Just uh, basic day-to-day uh, -day operations. And, uh, did I turn all my lights off? believe I did. Oh, I left my strobe on. Silly me. That's it. That's it. There you go. That's uh, that's how you fly it. Um, it wasn't as well put together as my Mad Dog tutorial because I have less experience with this aircraft, but I'm happy to report that the things I mainly struggled with was just the tests, performing the equipment tests. As for just straight up flying it, uh, I'm pretty damn good on that. Uh, I think I performed pretty well on that. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, leave a comment. Um, if you want to find the manuals for this aircraft, it's in the, it's in your aircraft's folder that you put into the community folder. That's where they are. Um, that's it. There you go. Um, I hope uh, the tutorial was helpful. As I said before, if I missed anything, ask me questions in the comments. Most definitely I can answer them for you. Um, do I think this aircraft is worth $70? Uh, no, I don't think anything in the flight simulation industry is worth more than like $20, no matter how much time and effort you put into it. Because at the end of the day, it's like a virtual product um, that cannot be used for real world training. I might add this, this is not something you can use to train to fly a real Fokker F-28, so it kind of loses all value, um, but I don't know, that's it, that's all I have to say about that, uh, alright, thanks for watching, see you guys later.